him and use him to encourage our hearts this morning. And we thank you so much for all that you've done for us in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we've got a, a few announcements here. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, in the prayer and when I spoke at the beginning, I covered the first two announcements. So the first one is for Pastor and Diane. And then the second one is about Brother Seth going to preach with us this, this morning. So uh, the next one is this week, tomorrow, our church and school kids head to camp. So please pray for their spiritual growth and for safety. And they'll leave and return on Saturday. And, and I really can't emphasize the importance that we pray for them. You may not know them personally, but you can say, Lord, just be with those, those uh, young people that are at camp. You know who they are. And Lord, I just ask that you will work in their heart and that they be open to whatever you have for them. Um, many great decisions have been made by young people at camp that have gone with them into adulthood, and you're looking at one of them. Uh, camp was so important in my life and I can just remember certain camps where I made decisions that have stuck with me uh, my life so I know the importance of camp so let's just as a church let's make sure we pray for them and then I I, I don't I don't want to bring this up but we have to bring it up but next Sunday will be the third class last Sunday with us um, he made a commitment to teach at IBC, and uh, he's going to start that in August, so he wants to fulfill that commitment. So this uh, next Sunday will be his last Sunday with us, and we'll have a appreciation and farewell barbecue at the Perez's home. Uh, the address is there. That will start at 5 p.m., and as I mentioned, they are going to provide the tri-tip and all the drinks. All right, so that's like 75% right there, right? So all that's left is... You bring a side dish, chips, whatever. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Please use that and and let us know what you'll be bringing, so that will help us to know if we need to bring any additional things and yourself. And that's it. And uh, we'll just have a wonderful time of fellowship. And um, you know, and and you know, say bye to them and, and thank them for their ministry here with us. And so I want to encourage you to be back here next Sunday to be able to say bye to them but um, it's been great having them and we're going to miss them and so we need to pray that the Lord will use them they're back in IBC in Arizona as he teaches uh, that time so at this time I'll have Brother Logan come up and lead 296 at the cross last and did my Savior bleed did my father die 296 
chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. I'll read the first verse, and then you can read the following verse, and then I'll read the verse after that, and then you can read the verse after that, and we'll make it through the whole passage together. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enemies. And he came and preached peace to those, to you who were afar off, and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. To whom you also are to be built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. This is God's word. Our next song is hymn number 285, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, Find a Place to Stay. 285. As we come to the offering time, I, I'd like to just read a verse to you this morning. Um, Psalms 107, verse 1, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Um, in the science school class this morning, we, we were talking about um, worry. And we said one of the best ways to deal with worry in your life is you, you, you take a moment 
and you think about all that God has done for you. All right? So in a few seconds, I, I just want you to think about all that the Lord has done for you, how he's provided for you up to this point. And now I want you to think about some of the issues that you have going on in your life right now that are causing you to worry. And now the question you ask yourself is, is God going to provide for me for those current concerns I have like he did in the past? And the answer is yes. But you don't know how, right? But when he answered those in the past, you didn't know how either, but he did. So the idea here is that when we take time to thank the Lord, it encourages our heart to know that he's going to take care of us and provide for us. And one of the greatest ways that we can show our gratitude to him for those things that he's done for us is by giving back to him through our tithes and offerings. And when you think about what the Lord asks, it's just a fraction of what he's given to us. And so as we think about that for a moment, I, I just want to encourage you to continue to be thankful, to think on those things that the Lord has done for you so that your heart will be encouraged and know that as you give to the Lord, you're giving back just a fraction of what he's done for you. And you're doing this in obedience, but you're also doing it to show your gratitude for all that he's done for you. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we, we just again thank you for this time and Lord, just this opportunity to be in your house. We just ask that you will be at the offering this morning. We just ask that you will help us to provide for the needs of our church. You continue to provide for us in a miraculous way, Lord. And Father, we're just trusting you in this area. Be with the, both the gift and the giver, Lord. And we thank you now for this time in your name. Amen.
him this morning before the message. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to pause yet. Okay. So after this hymn, we'll dismiss Junior Church and Nursery. Junior Church is four years old in fourth, fifth grade. And then Nursery is four. <laughs> okay. So the nursery is straight back in the back to the right. And then junior church, are you going to dismiss this one? Everybody got that? Okay. Our final hymn, which I hope we have all the slides for, uh, 295 Calvary covers it all, far dearer than all in the world can apart, was a message that came to my heart. 295. Let's stand and sing this together. to be with all of you this morning. If you could turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Let's go ahead and pray and then we will take a look at the passage this morning. Father, we thank you so much for the truth of the words that we just sang. It is such a huge relief, such a joy to know that Calvary does cover all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our despair, all of our judgment and condemnation. Father, I pray 
that you might help us as we take a look at this passage this morning. I pray that your spirit might do the work in our hearts that only he can do. I pray that first and foremost, that there's anyone here this morning who has not yet had Calvary cover their sin, who is still living in guilt and despair, that this morning they might see Christ. Your spirit might open their hearts and their eyes to you might turn from their sin and find in Christ the cleansing, the hope, the peace that can only be found in him. I pray for those of us that do know you, that have had our sin washed in the blood of the Lamb, that your word might convince our hearts, that we might meditate more and more on our salvation, and that that might drive us to live as you lived, to be transformed by your love and to love others as you have loved us. Uh, we are weak. We cannot do that without you. And so we pray for your grace this morning, that your word might do the work in each one of our hearts. And we pray this in Christ's name. For his I'm sure many of you know that when you go to a store, a lot of times, for example, when you go to a grocery store or pretty much any store, uh, and you start to walk to the checkout line, almost always there's a, a bunch of magazines around that area. And many of the magazines have headlines like, this famous person so-and-so did this really, really bad thing, and this famous person did this really, really bad thing. And, and you wonder how, why are those magazines there? Well, obviously the reason is because many people glory in knowing about other people's failures. That's right. Uh, in fact, there are many, many websites and many things shared on social media that do the same thing. They glory in the sins of others. Uh, there are many um, TV shows and sometimes even entire networks dedicated to magnifying the sins of others. And uh, there is some uh, perverse joy that many times we find in looking at other people and seeing their sin, and then many times sharing that sin joyously with other people. Uh, I think part of that comes from the fact that we all know that we have sinned in many ways, and it makes us feel better when we see other people fail in, in ways that we believe are greater than the ways that we have failed. It makes us feel like, oh, we're not as bad as those people. Uh, I think also it's a type of jealousy, especially when we have famous people that, that fail and sin. We think we want what they have, and then when they fail, it makes us feel better about ourselves and thinking, oh, at least I, I'm not bad like they, or they deserve to uh, suffer because they have a lot of money and I don't, or they have a great life and I don't. And sadly, uh, many times we delight in the sin of other people. And not only in their sin, but actually in sharing that sin with others and in, in discovering that sin and in revealing that sin to other people. But the truth is, and the, I think the message of the passage we're going to be looking at this morning, is that God is the opposite. God delights in covering our sin. Uh, we know that God's in control of all things, and a perfect song that goes right with the message I was going to sit, uh, preach this morning Calvary covers it all. God, even though he has every right as the perfect being that he is, and sinless to display our sin to all the world, he delights in covering the sin of all those who come to him. And we as his children should be like him. In Genesis chapter 9, uh, we have kind of a, a weird story. Uh, maybe a story that some of you may not have even hold, heard before. Uh, probably a story that many of you have heard, uh, but maybe not a story that you've heard a lot of preaching on. But in Genesis chapter 9, we have reached the end of probably one of the, the most famous stories in all the Bible, which is the story of the flood. And we know that Noah uh, talks about at the beginning of this story in chapter of Genesis chapter 6, how Noah was in the midst of a terrible culture surrounded by evil, surrounded by perverseness, and it was so bad that God said that every intent of the thought of man was only evil continually. And it became so bad that God said, I am going to wipe out the entire earth. 
Uh, you're going to kill everyone on the earth except for Noah, who it says found grace in the sight of the law. Uh, Noah was righteous, it says, and just because he found grace. It was not of his own grace, but the fact that God gave him the grace, and Noah looked to God for that grace to be righteous and just. And he's a shining light of what we should be. Uh, it says in another passage that he was a preacher of righteousness, that he, he was a light in, in a dark, dark place. And God in his mercy saved Noah and his family out of everyone else on the earth. But we see at the end of Genesis 9 a very sad story uh, for many different reasons. And that's the story I would like to take a look at this morning. So Genesis chapter 9, verse 18. Genesis chapter 9, verse 18. It says, Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So we see here a man who is, many people look at as one of the most righteous men in all the Bible. Noah, a man who walked with God, who was just, and on top of that, he was living in the most wicked time of all history when everyone else was evil. Uh, he spent many, many years trusting God, building an ark by faith, and uh, we see that, that God blessed him abundantly and God used him greatly. But just like every man outside of the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ, he was a sinner. Sure. And just like every man, sadly, he made wrong choices. And we see here after, and this many times happens, after a great victory, we're walking with God, we're doing really great, God is blessing us, and then sometimes we get comfortable. And we start to think, oh, I, I passed this test, I, I resisted this temptation, I went through this really difficult trial, and by God's grace, I've come through this, and I've, and I've done better. And then we start to feel like, I'm doing pretty good. I can relax. I don't have to battle as hard against sin. And that's exactly what Noah did. He had just been through the flood a year on a ship with a bunch of smelly animals and his family. <laughs> You guys can imagine spending, a, you guys can think back to COVID when you were trapped in a house with all of your family. Uh, but he was trapped in a ship with his family and a bunch of smelly animals and couldn't leave for over a year. Finally, he gets out. Uh, there's complete destruction. Everyone else on the earth is dead. And he starts to finally say, okay, finally, I can relax. So he, he plants a vineyard. Some people think that this is maybe the first vineyard. We don't really know. Uh, and he makes some wine. Uh, we don't know. Some people think that this was the first time he had tasted wine. Again, speculation, we really don't know. Uh, but we do know that he gets drunk. And just like everyone, when they are drunk, he makes some foolish decisions. Now, surely he was thinking, uh, since he was in his tent, he wasn't doing this out in public necessarily. He was in the privacy of his tent. He thought, oh, no one's going to know. I can kind of give myself this little pleasure of getting drunk and I'll just fall asleep and I'll leave my tent and no one else has to know about it or worry about it. And sadly, many times that's when we fall into sin. When we're relaxed, when we think I've come through the hardest time and then I can kind of let loose a little bit, especially when we're by ourselves and we think no one's watching. And that's what happens with Noah and sadly he goes, he gets drunk. And it says in verse 21 that he disgraces himself. He becomes uncovered in his tent. And the first lesson that we learn here today is the lesson that Noah is learning in this passage. And that lesson is, is that sin always brings shame. Sin always brings shame. So for Noah, a man of God, a man who delighted in walking with God, a man who was an example to the entire world, is now full of shame because of his decision to reject God's plan and do his own thing. 
And we see that, uh, again, this is a, a theme in the Bible. Many times when people get drunk or fall into sin, uh, shame comes with it. And many times God uses this to describe, in fact, uh, the, the judgment that comes with sin. In the book of Lamentations, chapter 4, uh, this is a book all about the judgment that was to come upon Israel. And in Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 21, it says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom. You who dwell in the land of Uz, the cup shall also pass over to you, and you shall become drunk and make yourself naked. The punishment of your iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no longer send you to captivity. He will punish your iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will uncover your sins. So this is true and has been true of all time. From the very beginning, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? They recognized that they were naked and they hid themselves. Why? Because they were ashamed. Sin always brings shame. And sometimes that shame can be so overwhelming that it can make us despair even of life. And sin can have such a great weight on us and bring so much shame into our lives that many people just completely despair. I read a really sad story a little while ago about a guy named Walter Montgomery. Uh, Walter Montgomery was a young man who was on the football team at his school. Uh, he uh, was from a solid family, had several siblings. Uh, he had just gone on a hunting trip with his dad. Uh, he came back and he had just, again, just turned 16. This was in uh, December of 2022. And he got on Instagram late at night. And uh, a girl, uh, when he thought it was a girl, started texting him or messaging him on Instagram. And uh, the conversation devolved into some inappropriate things. And the girl started asking for some inappropriate pictures. So he sent her some inappropriate pictures. And before he knew it, she was saying, if you don't send me $1,000, I'm gonna publish these pictures all over the internet and send them to your parents. And he said, please, please don't do that. I don't have the money. Maybe I can get it later, but I don't have any money. I can't send you these things. And she said, uh, I don't care. I'm going to do it unless you find a way to get that money. He said, well, if you, if you do this, if you don't do this, I'm going to take my own life because there's no way I can let this happen. And she says, okay, kill yourself. And sadly, that's exactly what he did. His parents found him the next morning and dead. Why? Because of the shame that he thought he was going to have to face. And sadly, this is how many of us live our lives. We live our lives in constant fear of the shame that our sin brings and that weight that is on our back, that guilt, that shame, that despair, because that's what sin does. It brings shame. We obviously know in this situation that that, that person was a very evil person that was taking advantage of a young man. But that's what they understood. They understood the power of the shame that sin brings. And they, that's what the devil does. He takes advantage of that same truth. And we have to realize that sin always brings shame. The devil wants to tell us, like he told Adam and Eve, no, no, you can sin and it brings power. It brings joy. It brings satisfaction. But I guarantee you, the Bible teaches very clearly, sin always ends in shame and guilt. And we see this in our own lives. Many times we think, well, if I just tell this lie, I'll get out of this problem, and then everything will be better, and then I'll be able to have control of the situation. Until what happens? The lie is found out, and then we're even more ashamed than before. How many times do we think, you know what? Uh, I can... Just let go of this anger, and then I will be able to control the situation and let everyone else know where I feel, and then I'll feel a lot better. And you yell and you scream at your loved ones, and then how do you feel? A lot better? No. You feel ashamed. You feel broken. You feel guilty because you know what you did was wrong. How many times do we think, oh, if I, if I watch this, I'll be satisfied and happy. And you watch it, and for a moment, it brings pleasure. And then afterwards, you're filled with shame and regret and guilt. And that's what sin always does. We think, oh, man, I'm just going to be lazy and not do my responsibilities. And I know I'm supposed to accomplish our work, and then I'll feel better. 
and you just feel worse because we're filled with shame because we know we haven't accomplished what God has called us to accomplish. And that is always what happens with sin. Sin always brings shame. David knew about this. David, again, after the heart of God, walked with God, and yet he fell into sin, into adultery, and then murder. But the good news is, and this is what David shares with us in Psalm 32, and this is what brings comfort to our hearts. It says in Psalm 32, verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. One of my favorite passages is Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, it says in verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from him. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our he remembers that we are dust. Every single one of us has felt the guilt and shame of sin. If you are human and you are sitting here today, you know what I am talking about. I know how many times I have failed God. I have sinned against him. I have rebelled against him. I have hurt other people. I have hurt those that have treated me with love. And the guilt and the shame that fills my heart every time I but the good news I have for you today is that Jesus came and died in our place to take away our shame. Calvary covers it all. He died and he took the shame that we deserved so that we might be able to have freedom from shame. One of the hymns says, I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood. He fixed his languid eyes on me and as near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. Alas, I knew not what I did, but now my tears are vain. Where shall my trembling soul be hid? For I, the Lord, have slain. A second look he gave, I said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for thy ransom paid. I die that thou mayst live. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled. My heart is filled to think he died for me. There is no better news for a guilty, ashamed sinner than the cross of Christ. Jesus died for Noah's shame as he lay uncovered in his tent. Jesus died for my shame as I have sinned against him time after time and felt the weight of the guilt and the shame. Jesus died for your sin, and he promises that if you turn from your sin and believe that only he can save you, he will wipe clean your heart. He will remove your sin as far as the east is from the west and bury it in the depths of the sea because he wants to take your shame. Jesus was ashamed on the cross. He took our shame on the cross, dying the death of a sinner condemned so that we might no longer have to take that shame. Noah was ashamed because of, our, because of his sin. And we all feel that same shame. But God delights in covering our shame. 
But we continue to read, and again, there is both a positive and a negative here. In verse 22, again, going back to Genesis 9, Noah has sinned, he has got drunk, he has shamed himself by laying naked in his tent. And it says in verse 22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Again, like I mentioned at the beginning, for some reason, as humans, we find this perverse delight in exposing the shame of other people. And we don't know if, if Ham was bitter at his father because he thought, oh, my father's always the goody two-shoes. He's always making us do all this work and building this ark, and he's always doing what's right. But look, he, he's failed too. And how many times have we felt like that? We see people who are doing what's right and are, are, are doing what they're supposed to be doing, and somehow we delight it in them failing. Because again, it makes us feel better. It makes us feel like, look, I can sin because look, this guy is supposed to be so righteous. Noah, he's my dad. He's supposed to be my example. Look at him. Look, guys, he's, he's failed just as much as we fail. It makes us feel better about and Ham makes this foolish, sinful choice to delight and to display the shame of his father. But his brothers do the opposite. Verse 23, instead of laughing and saying, oh yeah, ha, ha, look at dad. He always thinks he's so righteous. And look at him. What do they do? Verse 23, but Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Not only do they not laugh, but they make the decision to cover their father's shame. Did their father deserve to be shamed? Yes. He had sinned. He had failed. But instead of delighting in it, they say, we don't want anyone else to see our father. In fact, not only do we not want anyone else to see our father, because we don't even want the image of our father's failure in our head. We do not want to think about it. We don't even want to see it. So they turned their back and didn't even look and did everything possible to make sure they didn't think about it, they didn't meditate on it, they didn't remember it, they didn't see it, and to make sure no one else saw their father's shame. They did everything possible to cover their father's shame. And that's how we should be. Not only do we need to understand that sin always brings shame, but those of us that have had our sin covered, those of us that have felt the weight of shame of our sin, we should want to love others as Christ has loved us and cover their shame. Uh, I went to a, a university, a Christian university, uh, and at that university we had a fairly large auditorium uh, that sat about 8,000 people. And every day we would go to chapel, like we have here at the school. Uh, but at that chapel, instead of having 40 or 50 people or 100 people in the room, there was 5,000 to 6,000 people of other college students as well as teachers and faculty. And every day we would have this chapel. And um, in this chapel, there would be preaching every day. And many times, as you know, those of you that have been to college know, you get really, really tired at college. I mean, some people don't sleep as much as they should. And, you have a lot of studying and other activities. And uh, one of my friends, uh, who actually attended this school many, many years ago, um, if I can say his name, Mr. Logan will know him. Uh, but one of my friends was at the university with me, and uh, he uh, sadly wasn't always doing what he should be doing. Uh, and uh, he was sitting close to the front of the auditorium. Again, this is an 8,000 seat auditorium, thousands and thousands of people all over. And one of the one of the speakers, uh, every once in a while, delighted in in uh, uncovering the sin of the students. And um, so one time uh, we were in chapel, and again he's he's preaching about the middle of the sermon. He looks into the first couple rows and points his finger right at my friend, in front of again five thousand other university students and faculty. And says, hey, you, second row, third down, wake up. You're sleeping. Wake up. You shouldn't be sleeping. <laughs> and he uh, embarrassed my friend in front of all of his friends and thousands and thousands of other people. Uh, I didn't necessarily agree with those tactics, um, uh, doing those things. In fact, 
I still remember when I was about 11 years old, I went to a youth event with not thousands of people, but about maybe 100 other teens. And I still remember uh, I was sitting in the chapel and the youth event consisted of about five different sermons in one day. And it was about the third sermon of the day, about one o'clock in the afternoon, it was pretty warm in there. And at that time, I now I, I speak Spanish and I understand Spanish. But at that time, I was still learning Spanish, and everything during the day was in Spanish. So I didn't understand a lot of what was going on anyway. So it was very difficult to focus on the third summer of the day, as well as not up and understanding what the quotes and quotes being said. And so I started to doze off, and um, the preacher did the same thing to me. He pointed me out, and in front of all my friends and everyone else, yelled at me. And I still remember that to this day, because they uncovered my sin, my shame, right? And that is exactly what Ham is doing here, and that's what many times we do. But God says those that have been saved, those that have experienced salvation, instead of being like Ham, will be like Shemajim. We will delight in covering other people's sin as well. In 1 Peter chapter 4, this is what it tells us. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, And above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. If we really have experienced salvation, then we should delight in covering sin just like God covers sin. Now we all know there are situations, just like with God and Jesus, when sin needs to be exposed. So Jesus himself exposed the sins of the Pharisees very publicly. Uh, there are many times where prophets would expose the sins of kings and other people very publicly. And there are times when we should expose sin, especially if it's a false prophet or a false teacher who is affecting many other people, especially if it is someone that is hurting people, say an abuser or someone that is uh, doing something that is illegal that needs to be exposed and that needs to be brought to justice. There are definitely times, I do not want you to get the impression that they, we should always cover people's sin. Uh, we know that there are times when sin needs to be exposed to the correct authorities, to the correct people for that sin to be dealt with correctly. But most of the time when we expose sin, we're not doing it for the help of others. We're not doing it for the help of the person that is sinning. We're doing it because we delight in exposing other people's sin. And sadly, some of the times when we do it the most with our own family members. Kids love pointing out the sin of their parents. Parents love pointing out the sin of their spouses. Why? Because we really want them to grow and really care about them? No, because we, it feeds our pride. It makes us feel better about our own sin. But that's not the attitude that God wants us to have. That's the attitude of Ham, not the attitude of Shem and Jacob. Just like Shem and Japheth, we should want to do everything possible to cover the sins of those who are in We shouldn't delight in sharing the sin of our family with people outside the family. We shouldn't delight in talking about the sin of other people, even celebrities or politicians. It shouldn't delight us to share their sins. Sometimes it's necessary to point out the sin of those who are in leadership, but it shouldn't bring us joy. It shouldn't be something that we do to exalt ourselves. We should be like Shem and Japheth that choose to not even think about the sin of others. To choose that all that we can to cover their sin instead of gossiping, instead of blaming, instead of accusing, instead of delighting and posting on social media sites about the failures and sins of others, our joy should be in covering their sin forgiving them, not meditating on what they have done against us. What happens when we don't do that? It divides. It makes it so people no longer trust us. It makes it so they then want to cover, uncover our sin. It brings shame and, and hatred and bitterness. It corrupts, it corrupts us and the people that we are sharing that sin with. It shows a, a, a lack of understanding of God's forgiveness of our own sin. God delights in covering sin, and that should be our delight as well. 
And then finally, returning to Genesis chapter 9, verse 24. It says, So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. I think a lot of times I know when I listen to sermons, many times we have the bad habit of not really paying attention when we're reading the Bible. It's like, oh, he'll explain it to me, he'll talk to me about it. But I think it's really important that when someone is preaching, that in every time you read the Bible, that you really focus on what the words are saying. So I want you to look back at what we just read, and I want you, you don't have to tell me out loud, but I want you to just take a second and figure out, there should be something in your mind that said, what? What just happened? Uh, if you're reading carefully, you should have come across a very big problem in this passage that should bother you. Mm -hmm. Give you a second to look at your Bibles and figure out what that problem is if you didn't already figure it out. So for those of you that didn't figure out, let me tell you what the problem is. <laughs> Who was the one that uncovered Noah's nakedness? Ham, right? Who gets condemned and cursed? Is it Ham? You shake your head. No! Look at verse 25. Cursed be Canaan. Verse uh, 26. May Canaan be his servant. Verse 27. May Canaan be his servant. But Ham is the one that sinned. Ham is the one that didn't cover up his father. Ham is the one that shamed his father. So why is Canaan being cursed? Well, who is Canaan first of all? Well, if you notice, almost every time it mentions Ham in this passage, it tells us also who Canaan is. Look back at verse 18. And Ham was the father of Canaan. Verse 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan. Now, this is also interesting because if you read the next chapter in chapter 10, it actually tells us that Canaan was the youngest of Ham's sons. So he wasn't even the only son, and he wasn't even the oldest who you would think. So if you look at chapter 10, verse 6, the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. So why is Canaan getting the cursing, and why is and not one of his other brothers. And why is it not his father? Well, we don't know all the answers, but one thing we do know is who comes from Canaan. Again, if you read in chapter 10, it tells us all of the people that come from Canaan, um, from Canaan in verse 15. Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn in Heth, the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Archite, the Sinite, the Arvadite, the Zemorite, the Hamathite, and afterwards the family of the Canaanites were dispersed. Who were the Canaanites? The Canaanites were the enemies of Israel. The descendants of Canaan were the people who were constantly in conflict with Israel and who God commanded Israel to completely wipe out. Why? Because the Canaanites had devolved into the, one of the most perverse people groups in the entire world. They were obsessed with evil and perverseness. Their religion was a religion of pure, just things I can't even mention in church was so evil and perverse. So why is Canaan condemned? Because Canaan followed in the steps of his father. And he passed that down to his children who followed in his example. So what we see here is that that perversion of Ham not covering sin but shaming his dad to make himself feel better and uncovering the sin of others his son sees that and he does the same thing and his son sees that and he does the same thing and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and this is what we see in our culture today when parents are constantly accusing each other and uncovering the sin of one another what are the kids going to do the same thing 
And it's going to be passed on and on and on. And we're constantly this. And, and when we're gossiping and uncovering the sin of others and accusing each other and, and having this type of attitude, it's going to affect the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. And we see here the last thing that we learn is not only do we need to understand that sin always brings shame, not only do we need to cover the shame of others, but we need to fear the consequences of delighting in shame. There are consequences to delight in shame. But on the other hand, we see the consequences of Shem and Jacob and how they are blessed. Why? Because instead of shaming others and covering their sin and choosing to make themselves better, they cover the sin of their father. They, they chose to not even look at it or think about it. And that should be all as well. There's a story, a parable about someone who was really into gossiping. And they gossiped about all the problems of everyone around them, and it, it turned out that it caused a lot of pain and sorrow. And finally the gossip was like, he went to this really wise person and said, hey, can you tell me how I can fix all the problems I've caused by gossip? And the wise person said, well, first of all, I want you to take a bag full of feathers, and I want you to go from your house to my house, and I want you to drop one feather every couple of feet. And then comes to my house. And then he said, like, okay, it's kind of weird. So he does it, he drops a feather every couple of feet, gets to the guy's house, and the guy's like, okay, now I want you to go back and I want you to get all the feathers back in the bag. He goes back and he finds about one or two feathers and all the other feathers have blown all around the world. And impossible to get back. He said, that's how it is with gossip. Once it's out, James says that the tongue is a fire. It destroys. Once we've accused, once we've uncovered the sin of others just for our own delight, for our own joy, to make ourselves feel better, we can't cover it up anymore. It's out. So what do we do? We need to turn to Christ. Because we need to ask forgiveness, first of all, for the sin that we have made. We need to glory in the fact that he has covered our sin. And then we need to ask him for the grace to do the same for others. To not meditate on their sin, to not delight in sharing the sins of others, but instead, like it says in Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne. Again, at the cross, Jesus, the only person who never sinned, who had nothing to be ashamed of, took all of my shame and your shame. The cross was a symbol of the worst possible way to die. Everyone would look at the cross and see the person on that cross as a terrible, terrible person. On top of that, they were literally shamed. They were stripped completely naked in front of everyone. And then on top of that, on the cross, the Bible says Jesus took all of our sin on himself so that God the Father turned his face from God the Son because he could not look at us. And he did all of that, taking all of our shame to cover our shame. So first, if there's anyone here today that is filled with guilt and shame because of your own sin, know there's a solution. Jesus died to take away your guilt and your shame, to give you a new heart and a new life, a new purpose. Turn to him today. Please come talk to me. Come talk to Mr. Logan. We would love to share with you how you can have that shame and guilt, that burden be relieved. But those of us that have known Christ, that have been forgiven, that have had our sin washed away, may we ask God's forgiveness for delighting and uncovering the sin of others. And may we ask for his grace to delight in covering sin, just like he has covered our sin. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, forgive us for so many times delighting and sharing the sins of others. We know that we do it because it makes us feel better. We think, oh, I'm so much better than this person by accusing others and tearing down others and even in our own minds just thinking about 
the evil that other people have done against us or against others and, and comparing our, to ourselves. Forgive us, Lord. Give us the grace to have the love of God in our hearts. And as we meditate on God's love and covering our sin, may we delight as God delights in covering our sin and in covering the sins of one another. Love covers a multitude of sins. May that be true of each one of our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Thank you, Pastor Seth. Um, we, we haven't sung Calvary Covers at all in, in, in many years. Um, and it just shows how God has uh, weaved um, both the Sturge Bottoms out from here the selection of that hymn and working in your life to, to put it all together. Let's sing that, that song again, 295. Uh, Calvary covers it all. It's in that blue book under the, under the seat in front of you. <coughs> A wonderful thing to Let's stand and sing this again. 295. guilt released from your life through the blood of Jesus Christ. We'd be glad, we'd be more than glad and happy to help you. Um, we'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this, this morning and we thank you for how you have orchestrated all the events around this weekend to do exactly what you would what you would want to have happen. Lord, we also believe that this message is for us that there is in this room those that are ashamed of their sin and have no covering for it. That one day they will have to answer to you for their sin. And it's a fearful and, and sorrowful future they have in front of them. Lord, help them to understand that the blessing, the relief that comes through their guilt and shame being taken away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, give them hope, a small portion of hope that they may follow that prompting of the Spirit to find release at the foot of the cross. I pray also for those that have found that release, that, that freedom that you give to us, that you would help us to imitate the covering that you give to us as we deal with others, that we would be forgivers filled with mercy and that we would live lives imitating your son Jesus Christ in whose name we pray Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.